My name is Amr. I'm from Jordan. I moved uh, with my family to the uh, U.S. We faced in Jordan a lot of persecution. Uh, it was so hard, but when we came here too, it wasn't easy for us. Me and my wife, uh, Victoria, was praying for the, um, the state and the cities that don't have Arabic church. After a long time praying, God said Cincinnati. We have a significant group of Arab-speaking people, so we've been praying for quite some time. God, would you give us someone that we can just kind of turn loose in that people group, right? And uh, Honor literally just called me out of the blue. There is not a lot of people know the culture, know their language, and can share the gospel with them. This is why we came here. Farmers of Family was part of the coronavirus relief. They just kind of called and said, hey, we got some free food. Would you guys be able to hand it out to your community? We opened the parking lot and the people coming with the cars. We talk with them, we pray with them, and also we take some boxes to deliver it to the families. They can't come here. It's an opportunity to share the gospel. We'll continue with games, we'll have egg hunting, and we'll have dinner, and we'll invite the people to go inside the church and join our service. It's wonderful what's going on. They feel in the church, they feel we are more family. It's an amazing opportunity. We came to reach our community, the whole Arab people, and now we have people from at least nine countries from the Arab world. When you give to Annie Armstrong, you don't give to an organization, you give to the missionaries, and that allowed them to share the gospel. God has brought honor here, and we're going to support him, we're going to encourage him, we're going to walk with him, and we're going to see God get glory among their people in Cincinnati. Well, amen. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you here this morning, and uh, isn't the weather getting nice outside? It's wonderful, and as you saw on our uh, video this morning, uh, we're remembering uh, this uh, week, a uh, week of prayer for uh, uh, international or North American missions, and uh, you know there's over, I think, 275 million people in, in North America without the gospel who, who haven't come to Christ. So there's a lot of people out there who don't know Jesus, and so as you uh, follow your prayer guide this week, it kind of also educates you as far as what the uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering does. It's for uh, uh, witnessing, uh, planting churches in North America. Uh, but there's so many different cultures have come to North America. It's actually like an international mission field. And uh, so uh, be praying for that and keep that in mind as we uh, go into the Easter season. Remember, it's all about uh, Christ came to give us salvation, right? And that's our message. So uh, keep that in mind. If you'd like to give to the uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering, uh, when you give to the church, a portion of it uh, uh, goes to uh, the cooperative program. But for the Annie Armstrong, that's an extra uh, offering. If you give to the mission fund, a portion of that goes to Annie Armstrong. Or you can just uh, put on your envelope Annie Armstrong or uh, uh, or. Do Easter offering. That would be fine, too. We know what that's for, missions offering. And uh, it goes to help support uh, our missionaries. But uh, if you give to the mission fund, a portion of that will go to uh, our international, our North American, uh, our state missions offering. And that's a good way of doing it. I encourage you to do that. Uh, talking about mission work, wow, uh, we had a great week this week with our dinner theater. And uh, we, uh, matter of fact, uh, I would say we have about 300 people, workers, cast, and uh, guests, and everybody for the, the nights. That's a, that's a good bunch, you know. And I appreciate all the, uh, uh, the people who uh, shopped and prepared food. That was a lot of work in the kitchen, all the servers. Of course, all those are our, our media guys back here and our cast and our directors and our directors and Brother Steve, of course. You know, he's the... Uh, he's, uh, set builder and all that kind of stuff but I noticed one thing about this year that was unique I noticed the amount of of non-regular attenders that were coming uh, this uh, to me this uh, looked like the largest amount of non-regular about half the people I would guess were non-regular attenders uh, that came to this dinner theater uh, that's what it was all about and so thank you guys for inviting and uh, bringing people to your tables and uh, and encouraging that and uh, we trust that uh, the message will impact their lives. Also, uh, I want to also remember missions. Don't forget our Christmas child shoe boxes uh, that are uh, you will collect year round. Remember, I told you a few weeks ago that uh, some of those boxes are being delivered in Ukraine. Okay, and so uh, timely. 
uh, because in those boxes are gospel messages too for the families and so just keep that in mind as well and at this time uh, as we remember our missions brother doc is going to come and he's going to lead us in prayer uh, from the floor uh, for our missions and uh, here i just let you use my mic Prayer works. Thank you. I had a stroke in February. Kind of put me down. <laughs> Lord, we come to you today thanking you for being in our presence, for being our Lord, for being the Savior that we read about in your book. We're so grateful. Strengthen us. Forgive us, Lord, where we fail you. Have mercy upon us that are not able to do things that we want to do. And now bless each one that is here. As the word is preached, open our hearts to it. Help us to accept it and to use it and to share it. Lord, we build this building so we could come and have fellowship. Thank you for all that you have done in each life and particularly in accepting us as one of yours and us being saved. Father, help us to reach out to others. Help us to share. Help us to collect. And the pastor was talking about North American missions and other areas. Help us to dig deep and to give generously so that the word might go out and the world might hear about you and what you have done. Very few people give their lives for others. And you gave your life for each of us. Help us to respond to that. Help us to remember that as we live and work. We're so grateful to have a place to come to and to fellowship with each other and to know that the word is being given out. Help us then, Lord, to open our book every day and learn more about you and to share it with others. Lord, I don't have much to say other than thank you for being who you are and that as you look down upon us that you can forgive us of our sin. And you can accept us into your community and that we will reach out to others. And so I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, worship team. We've uh, never had a time where So we've never had a time where we uh, need to rely more upon our mighty fortress. Amen. And uh, we just uh, need to look to the Lord this morning. And that's where we're at in our text this morning. We're talking about from Mark chapter 11, verse 21, joining Christ in moving mountains to make way for the kingdom. And you say, what does that mean? Well, you'll find out as we. Uh, go into our message this morning. Uh, we're talking about joining Christ in moving mountains 
to make way for the kingdom from Mark chapter 11, verse 21. And remind you to pray for Pastor Bob. He's filling in at a sister church this morning. Their pastor had a death in their family, and so he's up there filling in for them this morning. So uh, remember Pastor Bob as he preaches up at uh, Calvary Baptist in Clinton. So uh, let's all stand. Let's look at our passage of Scripture this morning. And uh, we begin with verse 21, Mark chapter 11. It says this, And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses in sin. And verse 26, uh, some Bibles will have it, some won't, but it says, But if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your wrongdoing. And the reason some Bibles have it, some don't, uh, Matthew 6, 14 and 15 is the same as Mark 24 and 26, but uh, some manuscripts don't have 26 in Mark. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's not in the Bible because it is in Matthew. And so there's a debate over that. So some versions will have verse 26. Some won't. That doesn't change a thing because Matthew has them both. And so it's, it's good either way we go. How's that sound? So let's ask the Lord to bless his word this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. Uh, it's accuracy. I thank you that you preserved it for thousands of years. I thank you that we have your word today. And Lord, I pray that we will respond to it in a way that honors you. Lord, speak to our hearts. May we be uh, drawn to you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. I know we're covering some of the text we covered last week, but last week we focused more upon the cursing of the fig tree, and today we're going to focus more upon the prayer side of it. You see, the Lamb of God had arrived in Jerusalem to fulfill God's redemption plan. On the day of his arrival, his disciples and crowds were crying out for the Messiah to deliver them now, deliver them from the Roman tyranny that was persecuting them. On the second day, Jesus, on his way to the temple, pronounced a curse on the fig tree to demonstrate to his disciples that the Jewish temple worship was displeasing to God and would be destroyed. The curse of the fig tree is an analogy of the fruitlessness of the Jewish temple and its purpose. The Jews were to be a light to the world, but instead they embraced a self-vindicating righteousness, one based upon works, not on faith, one depending upon their own self-righteousness or their birthright, being Jews, and they totally rejected God's grace. And so Christ cursed the fig tree as an analogy to show what was going to happen to the temple and their worship system after they would reject Christ as well and he would be crucified. And after cursing the, tree, the fruit tree, uh, the fig tree, they, they went home and it was nighttime that the disciples did not see what was going on there. But the next day uh, they came back and, uh, and they saw, saw that the fruit tree or the fig tree did not have any figs on it. Remember when Christ went into the temple... He cleansed the temple because they turned the temple into a tourist trap rather than a house of worship. The court of the Gentiles was full of vendors selling sacrifice animals for a high price. And the Gentiles, their court was for them because they couldn't go into the temple to worship. Uh, it was like going to Walmart or a flea market or, a, or an auction house. And so they were restricted from really worshiping because their place of worship was turned over to some kind of a, a bizarre thing for uh, the selling of animals and to make a profit. Well, we find that the next day as Jesus and them were walking back to Jerusalem, we find that the disciples noted that the fig tree uh, had dried up from its roots. And they were astonished uh, at what had happened. And Christ used their astonishment to teach a vital lesson. Now the question is, why would the Lord in include a lesson of prayer right in the middle of this temple curse? Because uh, the truth of the matter is, is the disciples had been with Jesus for three years. They did not need to do much praying. When Jesus is with you, 
All you have to do is, Jesus did all the praying, basically. They just had to ask Jesus, and he would give things to them. And he was going to teach them there's coming a time real soon when he won't be with them anymore, and if they're going to depend upon God, they need to do it through prayer. And he was teaching them to pray. As long as he was with them, there wasn't a whole lot of praying. I mean, there might have been praising going on as much as he taught them, but they, all they had to do was ask Jesus, and he would answer them. And so the Lord was taking the opportunity to teach his disciples about the power of faith joined to the purpose and will of God, which can do far more than just cursing a fig tree. The fig tree got their attention, and now Jesus is going to give them the lesson. Now with the backdrop of the Mount of Olives there, he was teaching them about the power of having faith in God to remove mountains to clear the way for the advancement of God's kingdom. Now, when we talk about removing mountains in Scripture, it is used figuratively many times. Remember John the Baptist, it says in Isaiah 43, a voice cries in the wilderness. We know who that is, right? Prepare the way of the Lord. Listen to this. Make straight the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain shall be made low. The unleavened ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. So what John the Baptist was saying, you know, get all the mountains out of the way, bring up the valleys, let's get on a level playing field so you can see the Lord, listen to him, and not be hindered at all. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. He was saying, make it straight paths, get the mountains out of the way, get the valleys out of the way, make sure in your own life that you are ready to receive the Messiah who is coming. How many of y'all got mountains that keep you from seeing Jesus, huh? I mean, you got valleys to keep you from seeing Jesus, okay? So you get the picture. It was figuratively, but also it's literal in Scripture. We find in Zechariah 14, 4 through 10, on that day, talking about when Jesus comes, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem. And remember, that's where his disciples and him are right now when he's talking about this. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other southward. Then it goes on to say in the same prophecy, verse 9, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. That's when Jesus comes again. Amen? Amen. On that day the Lord will be one and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain. Okay? In other words, when the Lord comes, the mountain of olives is going to split and everything is going to be made flat. You say, what is this about? Uh, many refer to in the days of Noah, before the great flood, the topography of the earth wasn't as severe as it is today. You had uh, mountains that were not as high, and you have valleys not as deep. It was a rolling plain. And uh, many uh, believe that what happened at the flood was all this water came down, and where's that water going to go to? Well, all of a sudden the earth collapses and forms valleys. Uh, that's what we call oceans today, right? And then you've got mountain peaks rise up. So now we have rugged high mountains and we have varied, we have five mile high mountains and we have five mile deep oceans. Did you know that? Okay. And if that was all leveled out, that water would be where? Well, we won't talk about that anyway. But anyway, when Jesus comes, the land's going to be a plain. He's going to level it out, except Jerusalem will be uh, high up. So the idea of Jesus talking about removing a mountain has a figurative but also a literal idea. When he comes, the land and topography will be, uh, the mountain will be rooted out of the way. You say, why would the mountains be moved out of the way and flattened out? i tell you why. To make way for the kingdom. To make way for the kingdom. You say, why are, is John the Baptist preaching, make uh, straight your paths and let the hills come down, the valleys comes up? To make way for the kingdom. In your heart, make way for the kingdom. But physically on the earth, make way for the kingdom. Interesting thought in Revelation 16. I could stay all day here, but I won't. Revelation 16, verse 18, it talks about the seventh bowl of wrath. says there would be an earthquake as there has never been since man was on the earth. So great was the earthquake, the great city was split in three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Okay, this is right before Jesus comes. And then it says in verse uh, 20, And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. Right when Jesus comes. And great hailstones of about 100 pounds will fall from heaven on people and they curse God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. So God's going to change the topography of the land. 
what's he doing that for? To make way for the kingdom. Uh, metamorphically, uh, the analogy is get the mountains and valleys out of your life. Why? To make way for the kingdom. Okay, so when Jesus talks about removing mountains, he's just not talking. He has a figurative and literal idea in mind here. The literal will take place when he comes, okay? And when we pray and we look for his coming, we prepare for his kingdom, we're getting ready for the kingdom. Now, with that in mind, let's look more about the figurative aspect of it this morning, okay? Because we really don't need to move any physical mountains today, right? Okay? When Jesus comes, he'll take care of that. But have you ever stood in the shadow of a mountain blocking you from going forward in God's kingdom? In a figurative sense. You ever stood in the shadow of a mountain keeping you from serving God as you should? Uh, have you had something in your life that hinders your efficiency uh, or you fulfilling God's purpose or fulfilling God's mission? You know what it is, but there's a mountain there that's in the way, like a destructive habit. You want to have any of those mountains in your life? Or, or what about a character flaw that really needs to come down? Or what about a difficult marriage that needs to be come up? What about an impossible work situation? What about a financial problem? What about a physical illness? Or what about, you know, you want to do God's work and help advance his kingdom, but you're persecuted in some parts of the world? Or maybe people have closed minds, uh, and for them to come to the kingdom, they have to get an open mind. Or maybe there's a closed door. Maybe there's a closed opportunity. And from our text this morning, we will see four principles for joining Christ in moving mountains to make way for his kingdom. Now, you know, when we talk about making way for his kingdom in people's lives, uh, man, you say man has free will. People say that. I would say man's will is not free. You say, what do you mean? It's in bondage to Satan. You have a will, but Satan has control of the lost person's will. So therefore, they're led by the spirit of the prince. But in God's sovereignty, he is able to move the mountain. He does that by regeneration and by a grace that changes people's hearts and make them want to come to Jesus, then they're free in Jesus Christ. And so when we look at kingdom work, it's all about people coming to the kingdom, but man is helpless to come to the kingdom. God brings him to the kingdom. Once you're in the kingdom, he wants you to help him, to let him use you as he moves mountains for the kingdom to come in people's lives. The first thing we need to do this morning, or should, is to see the purpose of God. Let's go back to our fig tree. Uh, when they came back by that fig tree, it was dead and dried up that Christ had cursed. Verse 21 says, Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look. Okay. Then Jesus goes into the phrase, have faith in God. Then he goes into the discussion on praying. You know, when we pray, we need to see the purpose of God. So we pray rightly. It says in James 4, 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it upon your passions. So often we pray wrongly. We do pray. We pray as God's a little uh, lucky charm or we pray as he's Santa Claus. But this is not the kind of prayer we're talking about. We're talking about Praying according to God's purpose. Well, you know, I want that mountain removed so I can do what I want to do. Maybe that mountain's there to keep you from doing what you want to do. Because the Bible says the, the king's hand, heart is in the hand of the Lord. It's, it's like the, the rivers. Uh, he moves it wheresoever he will. And you ask, how does God move a river around? He puts a mountain in the way. Puts a mountain there and that river bounces off that mountain, goes to another mountain and follows the least resistance. And that's how God works. And maybe that mountain in your life is there to keep you from doing what you want to do. But then there's other times there are mountains that are there that you need removed so you can advance 
the kingdom cause. Okay? So your prayer maybe should not be all about you, but about what God wants. Okay? He has given you this big checkbook for kingdom work, not for your own work, not for your own fulfillment of lust. So we pray for our own self. See, we're talking about getting the heart back in line with God. We need to see the purpose of God. That's why John 5.19, Jesus says, The Son of Man can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Even Jesus on earth, what did Jesus do? Whatever he saw the Father doing, he joined him. And we as Christians, whatever we see God doing, when God opens our eyes to see God at work, that's his invitation for us to join him in that kingdom work. But sometimes there's a mountain there. That's what he's talking about. By faith we ask God to remove the mountain. Remove the mountain. You know, I've seen God remove the mountain in church sometimes. Uh, one time I was preaching. Uh, in the congregation was the head of the Latter-day Saints singles group for the Kansas City area. Okay. Uh, Mormon. You know, Mormon and Baptists don't believe the same thing, okay? The Mormons have faith in their church and in Joseph Smith. We have faith in Jesus alone. A church don't save us. Joseph Smith don't save us. You know, Jesus alone saves us by God's grace. Anyway, after church, after preaching a salvation message, she came up to me and she said, how could I have been so blind? I said, what do you mean? Because I've had it all wrong. I haven't been trusting Christ. And she had trusted Jesus right there during the service. Did I give the invitation? No. I just preached the message. God opened her eyes. He removed the mountain so she could see. And he saved her. Oh, we had fun with that one. A few weeks later, we asked her to give her a testimony on Sunday night, and she invited all her Mormon friends. We had four or five Mormon missionaries, a couple elders. All The church was half full of Mormons as she gave her gospel testimony. God. Yeah, we had a good time with that one. But the point is, that's when God removes the mountain. Really, her mountain was more of a blindness over her eyes where she couldn't see. It was a mountain of blindness. All of a sudden, you know, you go over the mountain, you see the sun. The mountain gets out of the way, you see the sun. All of a sudden, God lifted the shade, and she saw the S-O-N. She saw the sun. She believed in him. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 37, 5, Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Why are so many of our prayers for my sore toe, okay, or my aching back, or my neighbor's dog puked all over the homework of Johnny? You know, all of our prayers, I'm not making fun of those necessarily, but I'm saying is maybe we all delight ourselves in God and let his delights become our delights, and therefore, when his delights become our delights, we pray according to his delights, and he's gladly to hear those prayers on his delights, and he gives them to us, the delights of our hearts. When Christ cursed the fig tree, he was illustrating God's will because the tree was not fulfilling its purpose. And the disciples were understanding the purpose of God, and that's why Jesus said, have faith in God. Why would he say that? Because the whole system was having faith in self. Temple worship. Self-indicating righteousness. He didn't say have faith that you're a Jew. He didn't say have faith that you're the covenant people. He didn't say have faith in the temple. That was going to be destroyed. He said have faith in God. And so we start seeing the purpose of God. The whole idea of the cursing of the fig tree. The whole idea of this was they would have faith in God. And so... Many times we don't understand what's going on, but we need to see the purpose of God if we're going to remove mountains for kingdom advancement. We've got to see what God said. We've got to kind of have an understanding. That's why it says in James, you follow me now, say with me, James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. You ever heard that verse? God gives wisdom. Have you ever read the context of that verse? The context is for trials and tribulations. If you lack wisdom, ask God. You read the verses around that. If you're tempted, if you're tested, you wonder why this is happening, you need wisdom to see the purpose of God in it 
so that you can pray for the mounts to be removed. Not the mountain God doesn't want removed. Like Jonah in the belly of the whale. You know, he was hoping that the mountain would be removed. So he could have prayed, Lord, get me out of this fish. That mountain would never have been removed because the fish was the mountain. You know what the mountain for him really was, though? It was the mountain of not being willing to go, willing to go to Nineveh. And when he prayed, he suddenly had a repentant heart. He reasoned with the purpose of God. And when he, when he started praying and he got right with God, guess what happened to the whale? It spit him out on land. And Jonah took off to do what he was supposed to do. Amen. You know, so Jonah was in the belly of the whale because of rebellion. And God put a mountain there till he prayed according to the purpose of God. Then God removed the mountain, which was the whale. You know, if you like wisdom, in the trials of life, we need to see God. What's it all about? Now, you know, today we, we have this issue with Ukraine going on. Matter of fact, it's a terrible thing. I get so angry. I want to take out my water pistol and shoot the TV. Okay. I would say I would take out my real gun, but I might offend some of you. But anyway, I have to buy another one if I shot it. But anyway, it, y'all get angry about that? You get frustrated? Okay. But you know, what is going on here? Well, you know, we live in a day in which we have another Hitler roaming the earth. You know, we're either in World War III or we're on the verge of World War III. I can tell you this, Satan comes to kill and destroy. And God, many times men are led to a, to, by Satan to do what they do. But God uses men led by Satan to accomplish his sovereign plan. How do you prove that? Jesus is a perfect example. Jesus came to earth. These religious leaders, they were led by Satan, and they crucified Christ. But that was God's sovereign plan, wasn't it? God has a purpose. World War II, as evil as Hitler was, as many people died, God allowed evil men to do what they do, but God saw how it ended, so everything was set up. Now the Jewish people are back in their homeland, part of God's sovereign plan and as i understand prophecy there's a point in time in the future where a false messiah will usher in a false peace right and the world will oh he will be called the antichrist but then after that he will attempt to annihilate the jewish people and this false messiah the antichrist will be destroyed along with all those who embrace him when christ comes that's what's going to happen Okay, that's, that's the, the prophetic plan. The events that God allows in our world today is setting the state for this redemptive plan to take place. Okay. You know, I don't like it. Well, God doesn't either, right? I'm against it. Uh, what's happening? That's okay. You know, it's still God working, but God hates it as much as we do. But our responsibility as believers, is to see the purpose of God in this, is to pray and help as God leads and opportunity arises. You say, well, what should we do? Well, you ought to pray for the churches and believers in Ukraine. What do you think? There, there, you know, there's a lot of Baptists in, in Ukraine. Do you know that? There's a lot of Baptists. There's a lot of work going on, a lot of great work going on. And there's a lot of believers there. There's a lot of churches, and, and the leaders are still there praying and encouraging their people. We ought to pray for them. We pray for uh, them to have a gospel witness in this tragedy. So whatever you say is happening, on there are people dying all over the place over there. And they need the gospel. Amen? Amen. They need the gospel. And we talk about our shoeboxes, you know, sent there. There's gospel tracts in that, you know. Uh, God has a hand in that. Uh, we should pray for the churches and, and pray, pray, pray for peace. We should pray and uh, support humanitarian efforts, uh, ministries and missions and efforts as God leads you. Yeah, you should do that. We ought to pray for our government leaders. We need to appeal to God to give them wisdom. Uh, pray leaders are guided to do right. You know, uh, Pray for God to bring Mr. Putin to Jesus or take him to see Jesus or remove him from office. How's that? Pray he'll come to Jesus or he will literally go to Jesus or maybe he'll just be removed from office because of the damage he's doing. Uh, pray uh, for peace. Uh, ask God for mercy because of the tyranny. God has something in mind here, and I'm not sure how it's all going to end, 
But we can ask God for mercy on those who are suffering. What do you think? And yes, there is a time for just war. You know that? There's a time. You say, should we go over there and fight? Oh, so you really want to? Yeah, sure. Yeah. There's a time and place. The Bible says there's a time of peace and there's a time of... The Bible says that. There's a time for just war. And it's hard to sit by and watch people get massacred and sit by and do nothing. You say, well, I don't want to risk World War III. Well, you might be in it anyway. Okay. Which brings me to my next point. Sometimes when you do right as a nation, it doesn't always turn out right either. We know it always ends in the end with Jesus Christ. You know. What I'm saying is, if sometimes a nation does right but gets destroyed doing right, but that doesn't mean you lose credit for doing right. See, we're so afraid of dying when really we should be afraid of God. We should fear God and not what men can do to us. We're so afraid, say, well, man, I'm afraid that we'd, we'd, we'd have a nuclear war where that could never happen. Let me tell you something. You've been lulled to sleep. You've been basing your security on a false security. And the truth of the matter is, yes, the United States could be nuked and vaporized and many of the people dead. And yet, you say, that can't happen. Yes, it can. Yes, the Soviet Union, or sorry, Russia could be nuclear, nuclear, and it could be an exchange which knocks out the United States and Russia, even China. But you know the world will still go on. There's billions of people on this earth. Amen. Man's not going to end. What's it going to do? It just neutralize a country or two, kill a lot of people. Yeah, but that is a real possibility. Don't lull yourself to sleep. You say, well, we should do all things to avoid that. Oh, should you? Or should you stand for right and whatever happens, happens? And if you get vaporized, you go to see Jesus. Yeah. What do you think about that? We've got a lot of cowards out there today. There's no courage. It's all politics. You say, preacher, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. The truth of the matter is there's a time for just war. But we need to see the purpose of God. You know, the just war, you know, you know, protect the innocent. Yeah, I'm not calling for war necessarily. I'm saying we ought to pray for our leaders and understand there's a time and place for this. But whether in war, peace, persecution, suffering, oppression, slavery, poverty, wealth, disease, and death, we must seek God and be his witness. Even while fighting a war or hiding from persecutors or running for your life, whatever life throws at you, you need to be his witness. If you go out as a slave, go out as a slave. If you go out in a firing squad, go out in a firing squad. If you go out with a nuclear bomb, go out with a nuclear bomb. If you go out by disease or old age, you go out that way. We would just want to go out glorifying God, whatever it is. Because life is not about the things we possess or about the temporal. It's about the eternal. And so, therefore, we need to be people of principle. And we need to uh, be working uh, not against God, but with God. Lord, what is your purpose? What's going on? God is getting the Titanic ready to go down. Amen? Amen. Our job is to keep the lights on as long as we can. And sometimes you're stuck in the engine room that gets flooded first, Silligan. I'm sorry, buddy. But you get flooded first, and, but, but, and you don't have a chance to escape, but you help keep the lights on for people above to get off the boat. Listen, we have a gospel message. We have mountains to move. Amen? Amen. And if our death causes the furtherance of the gospel, that's a good thing. Amen. That's a good thing because it's not about us. It's about God, and he's removing mountains to make way for the kingdom. That's what he's doing. Well, we need to see the purpose of God and pray in the will of God. You know, so often we pray just to alleviate our pain. We need to pray about what is eternal. What, what is God doing here? You know, what is God trying to do? You know, remember the book of Daniel, brother. Bob's been preaching on that, and, and the fire furnace event. Remember that? That was all about bringing Nebuchadnezzar to Jesus. Do you know that? You know, who knows who might be brought to Jesus in these world events? I know if I was a soldier fighting, I'd be sure to go to Jesus first, wouldn't you? It's a call to be right with God. It's kind of strange the way world events goes. Civil war here in America was kind of strange. Both sides thought they were right. Both sides had conviction. Both sides were predominantly Christian. Both sides prayed to God. And both sides said, Lord, by your will, whoever 
you deliver the battle into victory, you know, so be it. They went out, they shot, they died, and God took care of the outcome. That's kind of strange, isn't it? But that's what happened. Ian Bounds, a great author on prayer, one of the foremost authors on prayer, great man from northern Missouri. He was a chaplain for the Confederacy, you know. Stonewall Jackson, devout Christian, you know, didn't fear death because he believed in the sovereignty of God. The only problem with him, he was on the wrong side in the war, okay? And he was shot by his own men, and he died. But, you know, you know, God's able to work all things out. But even in a civil war, God's will took place. His sovereignty prevailed. The United States was preserved. Why? Maybe it's to preserve the nation of Israel today. What do you think? Maybe that's what it was all about. You know. Oh, by the way, the slaves were free too. Amen? Amen. That was a very, that was a very uh, 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 powerful thing. When all the other world had not, they freed the slaves. The United States stayed in slavery. And, of course, there's still slavery today, but we won't go into all that as well. But we need to see the purpose of God. I know I'm going to speed up a little bit. We need to seek the power of God. When, when Peter, he, he said, look, the fig tree you've cursed has withered. And, and they were uh, curious, how did this happen? And, and we learned that God is the source of power. Uh, it's in Christ, from God. It's in Christ. It's through the Holy Spirit. And through the whole New Testament, you find that when they prayed, the place was shaken. And God can do abundantly more than we ask or think according to the power that works in us. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life. God has promised us power. He said, you will receive power and be my witnesses. See, we need to see the purpose of God, but we can't accomplish the purpose of God. So we need to seek the power of God so the mountain can be removed. You with me now? You with me? Remember Elijah, he called down fire from heaven, right? And brought on a revival to prove that God was the God. In the Old Testament, it wasn't by might or power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So we need to see the purpose of God and seek the power of Christ so that we can pray and be aligned with God so that mountain can be removed. The next thing we need to do is that we need to secure the presence of faith. Amen. You say, what do you mean by that? That's when Jesus says, have faith in God. In other words, you see his purpose, you're seeking his power, but one more thing you need, you need the presence of faith. You need to be able to pray. And, and when you're talking about, Lord, remove this mountain, okay, uh, that was uh, an analogy uh, that, you, that you expected your faith was have faith in God. Uh, you were trusting in God. Uh, it's not about your faith. It's about the power of God. I know many people say have faith in your faith. You just need to believe enough. No, 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 no. The, the faith should be in God, not in you and your faith. Is God able to remove the mountain? Do you believe God can remove the mountain? Has God spoke to your heart and given you the word of faith uh, through scripture or by watching work that he wants to remove the mountain? And as you observe those things, you start securing the presence of faith in your heart, in your mind, in your life. You start seeing it. You start believing it. And you, you're convicted of something unseen, as Hebrews says. And therefore, you have faith in God. This is what God wants. This is what God's going to do. And I'm going to ask him to do it. And guess what? When you do, that's faith. It happens. It happens. But you don't get the presence of faith by spending your day with earbuds, listening to your music, and, and watching TV, and living. You say, where do you get faith at? It comes by a relationship with the Lord. It comes by his word. Spend time in his word. And it's, see, we're getting into an issue here. It's about relationship. If you want to be able to remove mountains for kingdom work, I'd say you need to walk pretty close to Jesus. What do you think? First of all, you won't know what mountain to remove. You won't understand the purpose of removing the mountain. And you won't realize you need the power of God. to. You think you can do it yourself. That's why Jesus said, This kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. 
You need to secure the presence of faith. That talks about a devotion, a focus, a sold outness to the Lord and his will and purpose. Uh, otherwise, we call that Christianity. It's taking up your cross and just following Jesus. Not living for yourself, but living for the glory of God. Amen. Kind of like the soldiers on the battlefield. You know, they have, a, they have communication. You know, they, have, they can call in, you know, uh, an airdrop. Uh, they can call in missile. They can call in artillery. They can call in napalm or whatever. I don't know if they still do that. But anyway, you know, they, they got their coordinates, and they're out there, and they're fighting the enemy, and, and the enemy is strong, and they need to soften up the enemy. So they get on the radio and say, could you have pizza deliver us a large pepperoni pizza, a six-pack of Pepsi, and two tickets to the matinee tomorrow afternoon. Okay? I don't think the commander would respond positive to that. What do you think? The commander would say, you're in the middle of a battle. You know, this is a life or death situation. And you want that? But if you said, I need artillery at this coordinates right here, because uh, the enemy has got us surrounded, I need to soften the enemy to, 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 to remove that hill, literally remove that hill, I think the commanders would gladly launch the strike and make a path for you to move forward. What do you all think? And when it comes to prayer, you know, doing God's work, if it's prayer for God's glory to advance the kingdom, if there's a mountain in the way, call on the commander to remove the mountain. Guess what? He will remove the mountain and open the way. That's what Jesus is teaching here. He's talking about living by faith, trusting in him, and going forward in his power. That's what we should be all about. So we need to see the purpose of God. What is God up to? Well, God wants us to be witness, wants people to be saved, whatever. And, and you, you see what God's already doing and you join him. Now you've got to seek his power. How are you going to get that? By surrendering. You know, God's not going to give a bazooka to somebody who's going to blow himself up, right? Uh, he's not going to give a grenade to somebody who don't know how to use it. You know, we need to spend time with God to seek his power. He's not going to give you power so you can jump up, roll on the floor, and just shout hallelujah and let everybody know how spiritual you are. No, if you want power, you want power for what? I want power for my neighbor to be saved. Amen. I want power for God to be glorified. I want power to get out of this mess so I can go on and, and serve God in this kingdom. Yeah, God will give you power for that, but not just to, he's not going to waste, waste it if you don't know how you're going to use it. How do you know how you're going to use it? See the purpose of God, seek the power of Christ, secure the presence of faith. That's where it comes to seeking God and discerning what he's, what he's going to do. And you get your heart in the right place. And you believe God can, you believe God wants to, and you believe God will. What do you think? And once you do that, the next step is simply we speak the petition of prayer. That's why Jesus says in verse 34, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you shall have it, it will be yours. In the context of this, he's talking about kingdom work. He had just cursed the fig tree. He's talking about they're going to go out and advance the kingdom. They're going, to, they're going to move mountains for the kingdom. Guess what? After Christ died and rose, these disciples, they shook the world for Jesus. Amen. They went all over the world. Uh, Paul was a mountain mover. You know that? For the kingdom. You know, uh, the, the many Jewish people, and sometimes people like Stephen preached the kingdom and was, was a martyr. Some were martyrs, but the ones right behind him just took up the cause. And guess what? Because of the martyrs, advancement was made. And even in history, that's why we're here today, because mountains were moved for the kingdom. Amen. Think about it. And what's going on now, there's still mountains there. Literally, it's going to be removed when Jesus comes. But spiritually, we need to seek God's purpose, see his purpose, seek his power, secure the faith that comes by spending time with God, being wholeheartedly ready and willing to do what he wants, and pray. And as we pray, praying is the easy part. 
Oh, Jesus also, when you, when, you, when you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, you know, if you're going to pray, you've got to make sure you're right with God and your brother as well. Yes. You, know, you. you know, we're all in the army together here. Amen. We all advance on the same purpose. See, God does not build his church or build up his people by better ideas, better programs, or better methods, although such things can have a place in his work. God promises to truly reveal his power only through faithful believers who persistently pray and seek only his will. Will you join Christ in moving mountains for the kingdom? Or will you, like me many times, just want to move mountains just for my own self to get where I want to be? Let's think about that. Let's draw back into a relationship with Jesus. And yeah, while war rages in Ukraine, and yeah, we might be in war before you know it. Who knows? Never has been their time. We need to be praying, folks. Amen? Amen. Seeking God, you know. And uh, I know maybe we don't have the leader that you desire, but the, the leader's heart is turned as the river's turned. God puts mountains, and he can guide your leader where he wants them to be. That's why we ought to pray. Amen? We ought to pray. Well, let's pray, okay? Father, uh, help us this morning to seek to, to pray for the purpose of moving the mountains to further your kingdom. Help us understand that, that these things come by a close relationship with you. That we seek, you, we want to see your purpose. We want to seek your power. We want to secure the faith that's needed. And then we we say the petition. We pray the prayer. But Lord, help us to be people who pray. Your house should be called a house of prayer. And in this day and age, we know it's not a physical house. It's the temple, the church. The people ought to be a group of prayer people. And Lord, we know that's the only thing that really makes a difference in the world. It's you doing the work. And you've invited us to join you. And you respond to the prayers of your people that are for your glory, led of your spirit. Help that be our purpose this morning. And if there's some here who don't know you, may they trust you right where they're at. Confess Jesus as Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name.